I love it when people go quiet on demand. This means that, that, the, that the audience training is worked already and you all know what to do. Uh, but for those of you who are new, uh, welcome to Lightning Talks. This is possibly my favorite part of uh, PyCon Australia. Uh, we have here a bunch of people who are going to give five minute talks on topics they want to give five minute talks about. We're gonna try and get through as many of these as possible. And to do that, we need to make sure that when, uh, when I call your name, if you put your, your name on a card, that you get up on stage as soon as possible to set up your, uh, to set up your slides. Uh, Jim Massard and uh, Nikki Ringland are next on this side. Um, so how this works is uh, there'll be a timer for five minutes. At one minute, I will say something like, one minute, <laughs> to, let the, uh, to let the presenter know that there is one minute left. And at about 10 seconds left, we're gonna start by doing this. Quiet clapping that you can just hear. Can we practice this? Quiet clap. And then we applaud until they stop speaking. Stop. Great. That way we will not waste all that much time. So our first presenter today, believe it or not, is Tim Ansell, who, believe it or not, is going to tell us about how he has too many open source projects. So, uh, Nikki and Jim, get up here, and uh, Tim, take it away. Hello, everyone. Um, so this is a five-minute lightning talk, and I have 61 slides, so I'm going to talk very, very fast. Um, so, yes, I'm famous for having too many projects, but that's not what this talk is about today. Um, I have a secret, and that is I am not a uncaring robot. I am actually a human inside. And humans kind of suck. Um, <laughs> humans create bugs because they're not perfect. And I'm a human, so therefore I create bugs as much as I would like to be an uncaring robot machine. Um, <laughs> no, I'm a human and I create bugs. Um, so this is software. Great thing about software is it's just bits and um, I like software because you can patch it, you can fix it after the fact. You deploy a bug, you deploy a fix. All good. Um, this is hardware. Um, I hate hardware. Um, <laughs> hardware is much harder to patch. Um, good job. So this is an FPGA. Um, it's a reconfigurable piece of hardware. Um, it makes hardware problems, software problems. So that's why I love them. Um, but there was a little bit of trouble in paradise. Um, there are two major languages uh, for writing for FPGAs, Verilog and VHDL. And if you very look very carefully, you might notice that neither of them are Python. <laughs> oh. And so I was searching on the internet, as you do, procrastinating, doing work, and I came across this thing. Um, seemed pretty cool, and if you look really closely, there's one really cool fact about it. Um, it's Python, and this is a Python thing that lets you program for FPGAs, so yay! Um, and this is really good because Python is a powerful, productive language. Um, it works by generating Verilog, so you kind of don't get away from Verilog all that much, but it is much, much better. Um, but this isn't enough. Hardware is actually really hard to make. Um, and writing hardware is hard. And this is what I look like when I'm doing hardware. Um, so that technology I was talking about not only includes writing in Python, it includes a whole bunch of libraries. One of them is a CPU. Um, the CPU is, um, allows you to write uh, code rather than FPGA code. Um, so you reduce the hardware you write. Um, if you look carefully at this slide, you might notice something that makes me sad, though. Um, you're writing at C, not Python. Um, so, yep. Breathe. I have to remember to breathe. Um, so, we know <laughs> about something that runs on small processors. It's called MicroPython. Um, and so, let's run MicroPython on FPGAs. Um, and so, last year, Joel gave a talk, a lightning talk, called Porting MicroPython to FPGAs Live, and this is him failing to do so. Um, <laughs> but we don't accept failure, um, and so we finished it. 
um, we have working MicroPython on FPGA, and you can now write Python to run on a Python-based FPGA program. Um, we have a console working, and we have both QMU and real hardware working. We still need to do lots of peripherals. This is the hardware we're using. It's actually pretty cheap, 50 US dollars. Um, so what's happening in the future? Um, we still have lots to do. Some things work. I'm One not quite minute. sure the status of everything. Um, and so we also have some questions we don't know how to answer, like which boards do we support and the dynamic nature. Um, of Python. So we'll be hacking on at the sprints. Um, and these two guys, Jim, who is apparently up next, and Joel will be there hacking on it. And why would you do this? Because HTMISUB used an FPGA, and that's awesome. That's HTMISB. Um, and this is where it's used, We're recording conference right now. Um, you can find out more about that at my main conference talk, which is already up on the video. And so that's how I reached Nirvana. Python Nirvana. Python, 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 Python. Um, so, yep, come and hack on FPGAs and in Python with us at the sprints, and I would love you to come. Hey, thanks, Tim. Thanks, Tim, very much. Stop. Uh, Clinton McKinnon on this side, please. But first, uh, Jim Rosarad and Nikki Ringland, who's talking about a topic very close to my heart, the National Computer Science School and Grok Learning. Uh, thanks. Actually, just about the National Computer Science School. Um, there's only one microphone, so Jim is a silent uh, waver today. Um, uh, it's fine. <laughs> uh, so Tim actually volunteered us for this uh, lightning talk, um, which is exciting, which means that well, everyone loves NTSS. So uh, I'm Nikki Ringland. I help run the National Computer Science School and all of the amazing fun stuff that you're about to hear about. Um, this is Jim Musrat. He helps run the embedded stream uh, in the NCSS summer school. Um, so what is the summer school? If you've been to the summer school as a student or tutor, stand up, give us a wave. Woo! Yeah. Or teacher. Yes, because not only do we get 120 kids from all across Australia and New Zealand, bring them in to the, uh, to the University of Sydney for a 10-day residential camp that is so intensive that we have to pack more in and have an all-nighter on the last night. But we also invite awesome teachers along. So we've been asked a bunch of questions, uh, both yesterday in the education track and generally uh, all of the time, from programmers, how do I actually help education? I want to help teachers. I want to help students learn. The NCSS and related activities are a great way to get you guys involved so that you can help uh, Australia's future, basically. We heard about that in today's keynote. Let's everyone pitch in. Um, so at the moment, uh, a thing is running called the NCSS Challenge. Uh, so this is where we get 10,000 students, uh, or at least that's last year's numbers. I don't know the final numbers for this year yet. Um, to learn Python over five weeks. Now, five weeks of Python, we've got kids from year five to year 12 learning this. This is a pretty heavy commitment. And it turns out that they ask a lot of questions. 10,000 kids need tutors. Uh, we have a lot of tutors who are former students who want to give back to the community. In fact, I've noticed a few laptop screens open during presentations at PyCon already, not looking at anyone in the room. Um, but we need your help. Basically, we've got 10,000 kids who want to learn Python who have no idea what a syntax error is. And it's really hard, and it's really scary, and their teachers are trying, but they might not know either. So this is where it might be easy if you're bored uh, in class or at work, not that I would recommend that, um, and you want to pitch in and help out. Uh, you can do so from the comfort of your own couch. Um, Help, poor Jim is really struggling with this question. Uh, he doesn't know about variables, and I can say the, the right answer, which is... <laughs> actual, actual reply from your student. <laughs> um, so that's sometimes all that's needed, uh, maybe phrased a little bit more politely, to get uh, the student through and pass that frustration barrier. Another thing that you could help out with if you happen to identify as female is the Girls Programmer Network. This is something that I started up about 10 years ago in Sydney. We've now got GPN Canberra, Perth, Cairns, and Rockhampton. Why no Melbourne? <clears throat> 
Mm. But uh, the cool thing is, so th this, is, this is a photo from one of our recent uh, workshops. We run free workshops for girls from, from about year five to year 12. It started out small and it got much, much bigger and the girls are so amazingly excited. Uh, we're about to run another workshop next weekend. Uh, it booked out 180 spaces in 36 hours. Uh, there is so much demand for this. We provide a whole bunch of resources. It's really fun. We get a lot of pizza and a lot of chocolate. The girls make friends, have a super exciting, fun time exploring computer science-y stuff. Some of them learn something. Most of them learn that they can have fun with computers. They go away happy. They want to learn more. Um, so if you're interested, uh, here are some links. Come and talk to me. Uh, come and talk to Jim. He does have a voice. Um, <laughs> or talk to any of these folks. Uh, this is a photo from last year. This is a photo from the year before. One minute. This is a photo from the year before. Or you can ask Chris uh, or any of the other people who stood up before. Last time, uh, last time we had NCSS people giving a lightning talk here or at something, they pulled out the photo from 2006, where, oh, sorry, 2008, where I had much longer hair and it was slightly embarrassing. Uh, so thank you very much for tempted. not doing it. Yeah, okay, thank you very much. Um, so on deck we have Josh Simmons, but first, Clinton McKinnon, who's going to tell us about the amazing Star Lab. Thank you very much. Here's my slide. Uh, I am not nearly as prepared as the last two, so I'm uh, sorry. Uh, so I'm going to tell the story of this guy. Uh, we build a robotics kit for schools, and this was the first generation of our rover, which, um, uh, sorry. Uh, so we, we're a team of electrical engineers, so we thought uh, a robots kit, we aren't going to deal with that. We'll just get someone else to build it and ship it in. So we decided to get these things. Um, and they got we got a couple sample ones and they worked beautifully um so we were like okay cool into production um being kind of new grads mostly not long out of uni we thought ah oh, we'll just order them they'll uh kind of on the borderline of when we needed to get them shipped um and so they arrive we've got like our 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 hundred and oh no, sorry 50 of these things show up in the office and we're like okay now we've got to test them and then ship them out. Uh, we run through the testing and 20% of them are at spec. Um, and we've got 50 schools that are saying, where, where are our robots? Um, so the fun part was designing this new one. Uh, 3D printed uh, one of our engineers, because he was like, oh, I don't want to 3D print the first one. That's why we went for the other one. Uh, turn around in two weeks to design this. Um, then it took us another month, so we're quite late still in shipping them, of just three 3D printers kind of pumping these things out as quickly as we could and us on the phones going, yeah, we're, we're really sorry, we're, we're trying really hard, but yeah, uh, a, a, a massive learning experience. Um, <laughs> yeah, don't trust, uh, don't trust importers and uh, also make sure you have that lead time to kind of make sure you've uh, got enough time to prepare for these things. Um, yeah, again, not very well prepared. So uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm kind of done. Yay! <laughs> Thanks, Mike Clinton. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Stop, stop. Thank you. Uh, Paul Waper up on deck. But first, Josh Simmons, who's going to tell us about open source in education. Hello. I'm Josh, I'm with the Google Open Source Outreach Team and the Open Source Initiative. I'm going to briefly share a bunch of resources for teaching people software development through open source contributions. These will fly by pretty quickly, but the good news is you do not need to take notes. I have tweeted all the links during my talk yesterday using the teaching FOSS hashtag. But first, why? Uh, I began coding in the late 90s and I started hacking on things professionally in, the, uh, in 2002. My first contribution to open source was in 2013, and after, after a decade of learning really, really slowly, I learned very, very quickly. Uh, I, had to learn, I had to learn to work with other people, work to higher standards, etc. So learning software development through open source contributions uh, is a great way to get real world experience and just be held to higher standards. So that's why, let's dive in. First, programs. These are structured programs that help people get into software development using and contributing uh, by using and contributing to open source software. 
We have Coder Dojo, which is a global network of clubs. There are at least 10 in Melbourne, and there are over 100 in Australia. Uh, they're volunteer run, and they're for young people in general. Then we have Google Summer of Code and Google Coding, which is an international program. Also, uh, Google Summer of Code pays students to work on open source software over summer or winter here. Uh, Google Coding is for the younger set, ages 13 to 17. It's a uh, contest that happens in your summer. Then we have Outreachy. Outreachy is a program, of, uh, a program that supports women getting into computer science. Uh, last This year, the Linux Conf AU uh, team raised $29,000 to place three interns. Outreachy also supports uh, African Americans getting into open source through uh, back in the States. There's also Rails Girls Summer of Code, which differs from, G uh, from the previous two in a few critical ways. Uh, it is, uh, you apply as teams, and you do not have to apply to work on Rails. OK, uh, next up we have issue tags. These are tags that people use to describe the nature of issues or tasks on issue trackers in websites like GitHub. Projects have taken to using tags like easy and first timers only to identify useful work that can be done by people who are new. So there are a few aggregators. I'm not going to share the tags themselves, but first timers only is a great one that aggregates these issues. Your first PR is yet another. And upforgrabs.net. There are a couple other resources that don't fit neatly on a slide. Don't worry, I've tweeted them. Then we have projects. Suffice it to say that some projects are more welcoming than others. Uh, some projects are better structured for bringing on newcomers than others as well. So I'm going to recommend a few of them. First, there is Beware. Beware is here at this conference. Beware is, contribute, is part of the uh, sprints on Monday and Tuesday. So if you are interested or know people who are interested in, in getting into software development, Talk to the Beware people. Katie's in the front row, and Russell just gave a talk, is somewhere around here. Talk to these people. They're wonderful. It's a great project to contribute to. It's about using Python to do development on mobile, uh, native, do native mobile desktop and uh, web development on the front end. It's incredible. Habitica is a RPG for uh, building good habits and fighting procrastination, also very newbie friendly. There is Hoodie. Hoodie is a backend to, for web applications that supports uh, offline, uh, offline functionality. Public Lab, a personal favorite. Public Lab is a laboratory, a community of scientists who are building open source tools to do environmental science, citizen science. And then there are Tim, there's Tim Videos. Tim, he just, talk, he just gave a light talk a moment minute. ago. Tim Videos does software and hardware for recording and streaming conferences. OK, I will also say that any project you see participating in the programs I mentioned earlier has necessarily structured itself to take on newcomers. So I've listed four or five projects. There are hundreds of others that are also very welcoming and ideal for newcomers. So have I not shared enough information? Maybe I've shared too much and you don't know where to get started. So here are some excellent jumping off points. Opensource.com. A uh, great news site. There are a couple articles that I tweeted that specifically cover open source education. Opensource.guide is a collection of guides from GitHub, including how to contribute to open source. Lastly, teachingopensource.org. Of course, it's in the name. Thank you. Thanks, Josh. Thank you very much. Stop, 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 stop. Great. Uh, thank you. Uh, Tim Leslie up on deck. Uh, but first, Paul Waper, who is going to tell us about systematic problem solving. G'day, everyone. Um, I have spent many, many years of my life uh, working in uh, tech support, supporting customers. Who here has done that kind of thing, helped people out, and they ring you up and they say, uh, I've got this problem. Um, this, is, this is a pain for us all. And, you know, the thing that I really hate uh, especially is when people ring up and I say, my hovercraft is full of eels. And I, they, they ring, like, you know, a call a day. And I just want to be able to automate the, the process of them detecting that their hovercraft actually has eels and recognise that. And before they, before they think of calling me, they can actually just solve the problem themselves. The system will find this for them and tell them. So 
I've been working on a program project called Insights. Um, there, most of it is open source. That's a complication we can deal with later. But basically, this is what a rule looks like. This is a really, really simple rule because all it's going to do is make a response and you give it an error key. In this case, Hovercraft has yields. Um, and that way, we can recognize this error key as we evolve. But that's not really useful. That doesn't actually detect the, the problem. Um, here's the, the error message that we have. So we can, firstly, we can add key value pairs to the, the make response to tell the user stuff that they need to know. But the real power of insights comes in by pulling in parsers of various files. So we can see from the example, we're reading the Varlog messages file. Um, so we have, we pull in the messages parser and we say, yep, there's the kernel messages that eel is detected in hovercraft. Uh, and if that shared messages parser contains that error message, then tell the user. Okay, well, that's good. The messages does have a bunch of extra features for you. For example, um, we don't want 400 different rules reading the messages file for one particular string each. So instead, we have a set of filters. Um, you append filters, and this, this, at this point, the client on the machine gets the list of filtered keywords for the varlog messages file greps for those only uploads those messages you care about so already the the customer gets their eel detection much faster you can also instead of having to do that sort of boilerplate of the get you say i want to add a uh, because this is a really common pattern i just want to a an attribute called eels in hovercraft and if that's true, then I know I, the, the user has eels in their hovercraft, and then we tell them. So I can test for shared messages, eels in hovercraft. That all happens in the parsing stage rather than me having to loop through the, the, process, the, the messages file my, myself. But that's only useful if they're actually running the version of the kernel before when we fixed eels in hovercrafts. So I can pull in the uname, uh, the uname parser, and that checks the, the version string. The version string here is special, so it, does a, it actually does version comparison. Um, there are about, I think there are about 125 different parsers that we have for heaps of different things. Um, and we One can minute. then throw um, the... Um, yeah, we can then give the user useful information, by, like the fact that they're running this version of the kernel, and that can help them say, okay, do I need to upgrade or not? So this is specific information for that specific machine from the user. It's not just a generic, you, have, you probably have eels somewhere in a hovercraft, but it's your hovercraft, those are your eels, you need to deal with them. So the whole project is at github.com slash Red Hat Insights, my apologies. Um, and in case you like reading documentation, because I do, um, you can also go to Insights Core at Read the Docs um, and read all of the stuff that we've written. There's still plenty of stuff that I'm still working on documenting, but all good. Thank you. Stop. Thank you very much, Paul. I'm, I'm not going to do my terrible impression of a Hungarian accent at this point. <laughs> um, Tim Leslie is uh, presenting now. Um, Nick Moore, if you can uh, come and get up on deck. Uh, Tim, take it away. Thank you. All right, here we go. Um, today I'd like to talk to you about PEP628 and how it solves the world's oldest bug. But first, a bit of talk about circles. There are two different ways we could try to define a circle. We could define it as a continuous set of points with a constant diameter. And that would be an awful definition, and no one ever defines it like that. Or we could define it as the set of all points, which are a constant distance from the center. And we call that constant distance the radius. And this is a really good definition, and it's the definition that everyone uses. 
and it generalizes to higher dimensions and you can do lots of cool stuff. If you will look at a constant diameter shape, well, this shape could arguably be said to have a constant diameter in some sense of the word, but it's definitely not a circle. Circles don't, the diameter of a circle is not important. The radius of a circle is really important. And so we come to this definition that you've probably all seen before. You probably learned it a long time ago in maths. The pi is equal to the circumference of the circle divided by the diameter. And that this is a special number and it's really important. I would argue that this is a bug. This is a bug in mathematics and it's a bug that's been in mathematics for hundreds of years. I blame Leonard Euler. Um, what did that guy ever do? But, but it's definitely a bug. If we look at the impact of this bug, well, if you go, if you measure an angle around a circle in radians, pi gets you halfway around the circle. Who needs to go halfway around the circle? If you want to go all the way around the circle, you've got to go around 2 pi. If you look at a sine wave, going pi along the sine wave gets you halfway through your sine wave. You've got to go 2 pi to get all the way through your sine wave. Not only does this you know, none of this make any sense. It also makes it really hard to learn about radians and sine waves and all these things because you've constantly got to multiply by two or divide by two and when do I do that? And it's super confusing if you kind of can think back to your math class when you first learned that. I bet there are a few head scratches there about when do I divide by two, when do I multiply by two? But it's okay, we have a workaround for this. <laughs> we just use two pi everywhere. And if you look at any textbook, any maths textbook, any physics textbook, and any of the equations where it's dealing with circles or sine waves or anything where those things are hidden in the background, you'll see equations with 2 pi. We write 2 pi everywhere. If you write code to do these calculations, you'll be writing uh, some, some value equals 2 pi. You're constantly having to multiply this stupid number by 2 because of this bug. It's not a bad workaround, but boy, oh boy, it's not great. So we have a solution. We just define the correct circle constant, and the correct circle constant is tau. And tau is defined as the circumference divided by the radius, because the radius is the important part of a circle, not the diameter. Now, tau has lots of cool properties. It's, it's you know, irrational, it's transcendental, it's probably normal. <laughs> all of these cool things that we like about pi, tau has all those properties too, except it's actually useful. So when we look at our circle, going once around the circle in radians gives us tau. Halfway around the circle is half tau. A quarter way around the circle is a quarter of tau. It all makes sense. It all falls into place. On our sine wave, half a period is half tau. A full period is, is tau. It's exactly what you'd expect. You don't have to multiply, divide by two. Everything is nice and neat. All of our equations, there's no factors of two. If you ever find an equation in your maths where you have a pi and there's not a two next to it, it almost definitely means it's been arbitrarily cancelled out One with minute. some even number. Now, of course, pi then has this bug. <laughs> and in 2011, Nick Coughlin, who I think is in the room, said, hey, we should add tau to the maths module. It'll make everyone's life better. And Guido thought about it and he went, nah. <laughs> Five years passed. And then out of nowhere, out of the blue, if you look at the bug tracker, <laughs> So Nick, Nick got his birthday present. We all got the correct circle constant in Python. And if you, have a, if you, you know, bust out your Python interpreter, Python 3.6, you can now use tau. It's exactly equal to 2 pi. It does everything you want, everything you could imagine. And we have had victory. So obviously, we're at PyCon. So, next year. Yeah, so no, go away. <laughs> um, up on deck, we have Andrew Lonsdale, but first, Nick Moore. Yeah, hi, everybody. Um, so, I'm here to talk about Omnicode. Now, Unicode is a, an amazing encoding that lets us encode all of the glyphs of the, all the world's languages, but does it go far enough? 
I mean, there's this implicit, <laughs> there's, this, there's this assumption here that we only want the sensible languages, the languages that have already been defined, things that people have already invented. There has to be a consortium to decide whether it's sensible enough. I think we can go further with this idea. But first I want to talk about what one of these encodings actually is. When we save data, it isn't letters. It's just ones and zeros. We use them as a compact way to represent glyphs. We have to represent glyphs because we want to have documents. It would be very tedious reading a bunch of zeros and ones and going, oh, look, that's an A. That's definitely an A. An A is a glyph that means something to you. It, it, it is a letter, but it's also just a symbol with curves and things like that that you can interpret. You could save it as just a whole bunch of ones and zeros, little dots, pixels, but it would be much less compact. So really, the whole point of ASCII is a compression format with a predefined dictionary mm -hmm. that lets us store these glyphs much more compactly by using eight bits instead of hundreds. But it's not the only possible compression thing. We also have things like LZW that work out the dictionary as they go. So we can get rid of this whole idea of having a shared dictionary if we want and just store the pixels all the time. Or we can store strokes and curves and things like that. This is actually what a true type type font does. It stores a thing and it says, put this spline here and put this thing here and assemble that and now you've got a glyph. That's great, but you have to agree on what fonts to make available to people. And as we all know, they're not always available to everyone all the time. And sometimes the glyphs are wrong and sometimes they're weird looking and things like that. So why not just make your entire document an encoding of strokes within glyphs? And that's Omnicode. So, <laughs> so. So what you do is you store for every glyph of every document, you store all the strokes, all the lines, all the dots, and then you reassemble them as you go along. At this point, all the font nerds are, of course, horrified. <laughs> half of them, because I called them font nerds, the other half because I didn't call them typeface nerds. <laughs> the problem is you somehow have to get from this very childlike curve and thing to a nice looking font. And you can do that as a series of transforms that take the strokes that are like the canonical letter A and turn it into a nice looking letter A, tweak the X height, bleakness, all that sort of stuff, kerning. I mean, kerning is something very hard to get right, but in Omnicode, it's really easy. You can tweak that. Now, obviously, more complicated letters need a more complicated structure, but that's okay because they're encoding more information. That's a whole word, so that's okay. Um, so it's okay that it needs more information. And again, look, if we use that word a lot, compression will take care of it. It'll detect we've used the same shapes again and compress them down. So we end up basically back where we started. A document that is encoded in Omnicode, once it's compressed well with a theoretically perfect compressor, note the asterisk, <laughs> is just the same size as it would be in ASCII, really, more or less. <laughs> and probably smaller than the size of it plus the entire Unicode font. And you never get these. You never get random code points that turn out not to exist yet because you thought they were okay, but turns out they're not. So. I didn't mention emoji at any point in this speech, and I'm not going to. This is why. Because no one can agree what they look like. Um, when I started this whole concept, I was joking. But the further I get down this particular rabbit hole, the more I think that I might actually be serious. I'm not quite sure. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you very much. If you want, there's a URL with all the nonsense about this on the, uh, not on this slide. Thank you very much. <laughs> Well, I, I must say, I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to Python 4 when we all have to rewrite our uh, software again to deal with your strings. <laughs> I'm very, very excited indeed. Uh, up on deck, we have uh, Tisham Da, but first, Andrew Lonsdale. Uh, I'm very, actually, very happy to follow that talk because I've also f fallen down a rabbit hole that's getting more and more serious. So I'm here to talk about FastQE. So it begins a year ago when I was talking about side projects and how I get easily distracted. Um, but I was caught in a bit of a schedule clash. So I was talking, and to the left of me was Martin with a great talk on Python and bioinformatics. And to the right of me was Katie with a talk about the power and responsibility of Unicode. And I was, I was faced with a problem that I wish I could have gone to those talks while I was talking. And I also suspected that maybe my audience might have felt the same way by the end. <laughs> and so the first solution is just watch them on YouTube later. Well, the second one was to add a few slides to the end of my talk, combining my side project habit, bioinformatics, and emoji. And so you can probably guess which one I did. So luckily, first, I am a bioinformatician, so that bit wasn't too easy. Bioinformatics is essentially Pokemon. You throw your Pokeball at an organism, but instead of capturing the organism, you get back some genetic data. 
The Pokeballs, the next generation sequencing machines, they bring back ACs, Ts and Gs, which is the um, information. They're stored in a format called FastQ. That takes quality information about the reads um, and it, it um, encodes it in pretty arbitrary ASCII characters, as you can see at the bottom there. It's stored in a text format, which looks like that, and every fourth line is interesting. So we've got the quality scores that we've got, uh, the, the sequences, and then the quality information. And usually you'd visualise it to see the quality starts well at the start of our read, and on average, towards the end, it starts to drop off. So the characters are essentially arbitrary. We usually convert them back to numbers. Or we could use emoji instead. <laughs> so FastQ and emoji is FastQE. And it pretty much relies on a dictionary. So we know which quality scores are bad. So we use skull and poop and no entry sign. <laughs> and then we just use Python. So the uh, emojis come from PyEmojify. And the rest of the libraries there are pretty basic bioinformatics libraries from BioPython. And so the last slide of my talk last year was that, where I took two sequence files and worked out that, on average, the quality at the start and the end was a bit iffy. And that's actually typical of unprocessed reads from bioinformatics. And so that should have been the end of it. <laughs> and then a couple of months ago, somebody found it on GitHub. <laughs> and they tweeted it. And I was like, oh, that'd be good. We use it for education and public talks and school students. And my friends tried to stop me. <laughs> Said I should finish my PhD. <laughs> and somebody put it on the subreddit. Somebody said, be still my heart and tell your friend I love him. And so. You know, it was hard to stop. There was, there was a support request. I helped that person. Uh, but I resisted. I totally resisted until today. So there was a free talk in the lightning spot. <laughs> what choice did I have, really? So we've added in not just the mean, but also the minimum and the maximum for each position in the sequence read. And I put some readme and license stuff in there. And so now, if you run it, that's what happens. So if you put in some bioinformatics FastQ files, you get a nice, quick visual idea of how things are going. So the maximum, see those love heart faces? We know at the best, the quality is pretty good. On average, we've got sunglasses. We're pretty cool. But there's a few reads that are all a bit dodgy down the bottom. So you do some QA. I think that's maybe more fun to look at than a plot like that. <laughs> so this is a silly idea. But it's maybe not that silly. Um, Bioinformatics gets talked a bit about Python, there's a lot of us here, and so if you're curious about it, or actually you just love emoji, I'd encourage you to get involved. Um, it's on GitHub, and the conclusion is that good things can come out from a PyCon schedule clash. <laughs> and I had a good day. You're done. Thanks, Andrew. <laughs> I have nothing. Um, <laughs> Uh, Ridwin is up on deck, but first, Tisham Da. Uh, hi, I'm Tisham, uh, known as Watnik. Uh, there's a bit of snaking cables there. It's, I didn't do it. <laughs> uh, I got that word for most likely to destroy the world, and to sort of, I'm encouraging others to do it and destroy the world. Uh, this is an energy monitoring setup. Uh, there go, the black things are transformers capturing voltage, and the blue things are capturing current. Apparently, they're unsafe. Uh, and then there's stuff coming out of there into something I made as a little hardware board, which is a three-phase energy monitoring thing. It's sort of a mud map. The UniSA guy who is playing with it has done of capturing things on current clamps, voltages, and then in the bottom here is the interesting stuff, which if I can make this thing go full screen. Yep, uh, at the bottom here, yeah, Mosquito Server, OpenHab, Nginx, so some dynamic DNS, and then at the end, it's supposed to go off to some machine learning stuff. So we'll go to the machine learning stuff. So uh, you get, get a bit of time series data out of it. Voltage is at zero. The currents are something, and your phases are never balanced. You get squiggly lines everywhere, and some current flowing back in the neutral. Voltage is at zero because they're not calibrated yet. Frequency is not calibrated yet. So it's 51 instead of 50. Uh, yeah, so anyway, uh, get some data out of it. Uh, you send it to some platform. I use ThingSpeak because I'm an engineer and we play with MATLAB and ooh, in the back end there. And ThingSpeak is the thing that MATLAB made to get data from you. Uh, but obviously, I want to analyze it not in MATLAB but in Python. So uh, I 
sort of get started with machine learning. I am not an expert by any means, just looked up some tutorials. Kera sounded good, it sounded like an abstract, abstracted thing to get started with, and it supports multiple backends. Uh, so yeah, uh, you can switch between TensorFlow, use multiple GPUs, so on import ThingSpeak library to bet some data. These are my actual channel ID keys. So if you want to see what I'm doing in my house, you can use them. <laughs> so I'm encouraging other people to like sort of do my analysis because I got tired of looking at the graph after a while. <laughs> uh, so yeah, the, you load in some data and you plot it and that's what that looks like. A little bit of spiky nonsense. I don't know what it means. Uh, some of it is just turning on the aircon. The stuff, the blue ripply stuff at the bottom is just the fridge going on and off. So I want to see if I can predict when I will turn on the aircon, well, whether the robot can predict when I will turn on the aircon and maybe do it for me and I won't, I won't have to do it, or you know, when the fridge will be turned on and so on. So yeah, anyway. So you have to like massage the data around a bit, uh, do some pre-processing, which I don't think I did properly, hence there are errors in my machine learning answers. Uh, so differential, inverse of the differential, you have to give lots of sample to the machine learning thing to, for it to learn what, your, what, what the data means. You have to scale it down to minus one to one, uh, do an inverse of the scaled version. So if anybody has played with MNIST, uh, they take the MNIST standard data set, which has handwriting, they invert it, they rotate it, and use all that variations of the standard MNIST to train the neural, the convolutional neural networks. This is a RNN, it's a recursive neural network, so it's a sort of, uh, it's using the differential and one off and, and multiple versions of the off by one to sort of do a forecast mode uh, neural network. So you run the fit LSTM one on minute. that. And, oh, cool, I thought I wouldn't be able to make it to five minutes. Ah. <laughs> this is the end, and uh, it takes a while to run, more than five minutes. And in the end, you get sort of a, the orange is the data that went in, the blue is the data that neural network outputs given sort of as a fit of what you were doing, and the little blue ripples are fine, the big spikes, it doesn't fit very well too. And uh, that's that. Cool, thank you very much, thank you, thank you. Stop. Great, uh, Josh Driver is up on deck, but first, uh, Ridwin, who is going to uh, tell us about R. R. Or as I would prefer to put it, I'm Ridwin and I'm here to start a language war, but not really. I love Python, I love R. I work as a uh, data scientist, I work in both a lot. Um, I know that there are other people here who this might be relevant for, so I thought I'd grab a lightning strike. Now, there's one key point in this lightning talk, and it is this. There is an international community conference for R users and developers called Use R. It's coming to Brisbane, July 2018. You should consider coming. It will be great. I was at the one in Stanford a couple of years ago. It was really good. Apparently, they liked me enough to put me on the organizing committee, or maybe I didn't run fast enough. Now, I think a bunch of you might have had some experience a while ago with R or had an experience with some old R. Not all R is great. If you're thinking, oh, God, not that language, R has moved a lot. It is a really fastly moving, dynamic language. There's a whole lot of new stuff. There's some really beautiful functional um, concepts. This is not the stuff you saw 10 years ago. If you saw stuff I wrote 10 years ago, I'm really, really sorry. Another thing, so R and Python are kind of the two obvious choices for language support, but there's one other thing which we have in common which is very, very silly package names. So if you're interested in very, very silly package names, we have a conference for you. So, <laughs> remember, 10th to the 13th of July, 2018, Brisbane Convention Exhibition Centre. Come talk to me tomorrow if you're interested in information. Registration opens in January, thank you. Yay. Wonderful.
Uh, we have remarkably actually got to our overflows, so uh, Fraser, you're up on deck. Uh, but first, Josh Driver, who's going to tell us about full text search in Postgres. Hello. So today I'm talking about faster text search and full text search in PostgreSQL. So let's make a problem. Uh, I didn't really have any text, so I went to Project Gutenberg, got a big book, uh, found a Markov chain script on GitHub, and made a lot of data. <laughs> <laughs> so let's explore some types of text search. So this is a prefix search. We're searching for all the sen random Markov sentences that start with count, which, given the book, is really common. It takes about three seconds to find them all. Uh, so let's create an index. Here we're using text pattern ops. It's a bit different to your standard B-tree index because it's indexing by character instead of by byte. Now this means that you can index the character and do the binary lookup in the B-tree to officially work out whether that string, uh, find all the results of that string. And so this can speed up like and regex searches, which have a prefix like the one you saw here. And so now it's 450 milliseconds instead of three seconds, which is a big speed up. Now, substring searches are a little bit harder. Uh, here we're trying to find a very direction, <laughs> and that takes 70 seconds to search across the all three gigabytes. So we install the PostgreSQL contrib module, and we enable the pgtrgm extension. This gives us trigram indexes. Now, trigram indexes work by storing all the th consecutive three character uh, sequences in that column we're indexing. And this means that we can effectively do uh, substring searches with like and regex, case insensitive, pretty fast. So now this is taking three seconds instead of 70 seconds, which is a huge speed up. I should mention that the data I'm using here seems to be very bad for this use case. <laughs> Um, so now we're getting onto a full text search. This is a more extreme kind of search, which gives us a lot more flexibility in how we search. So the building blocks is search a text search vector. So here we have a sentence, the cloud rolled in over the evening, and it breaks it up into tokens. So the first thing it does is it forms text stemming, which means it reduces all the words to the base form. And this is defined by the dictionary, which here is English. And so clouds is essentially the same as cloud. And uh, this means we store less tokens, and we also get more results that are relevant to us, because if you're searching clouds, you probably want things that mention cloud. The second thing we do is remove things called stop words. These are really common words that provide little context in the search term we're searching. <laughs> and the second part of it is a text search query. So this allows us to query the text search vector that we built. So this performs the same text stemming and removing stop words. And it also has the ampersand and pipe operators to do and and all logic. And it also has the colon start uh, suffix to say, I want to search everything which has more characters. So the CLO, CLO there will also match cloud. And, uh, not mentioned here, you can include multiple words with spaces there to search a whole phrase. So let's put it all together. Uh, first of all, we might want to create an index on TS vector. This allows us to do uh, the, the queries on the TS vector much faster for our table. Uh, yeah, it's towards a pre-computed TS vector. And uh, for complex vectors, you s which include multiple columns in the vector or multiple columns from model tables, you may need to store the TS vector in the table itself. One minute. Update it with a thing. So here's an example query. Don't have timings on it. You can see the at, at there says, this query is searching this TS vector. And uh, if we want to go overboard, we have the TS rank function there. This generates a floating point number, which says how closely the query matches the vector. And then we have the TS headline, which does highlighting for us which by default does the bold HTML attribute, which is really handy for displaying output. So here's a summary. Prefix search, try text pattern ops. Like queries, you might want to try a trigram index. And for full text search, uh, look at Postgres features before you go to a more full-featured library, because it might have exactly what you need, 
all in the database. And here's some more links for the reading. Thank you. Um, thanks, Josh. Um, moderately perverse searching for count in, uh, in a Postgres talk. Um, I've had a slight mind blank. Was it Mike Leonard or was it uh, Jason who didn't want to present today? Who? Jason. Cool. Okay, great. So uh, on deck, we have uh, Mike Leonard. But first, we have Fraser Twi Twiddle on naming things. Sorry, Fraser Tweedale. Good day, everyone. Um, am I good? Yep. So as programmers, we need to give names to things, and that can sometimes be difficult. We need to think of a, uh, a useful name for a, for a variable or, a, or an object or a class or an abstraction that people can understand. Um, as someone reading code, we need to comprehend what the names of things mean. So I'm here to help with four small pieces of advice. Number one, avoid things. What good is a name if you cannot find something to give it to? So here is a function, uh, counts the number of occurrences of some subject element in a list of lists of that element. So you'll see in the example at the bottom, uh, number of occurrences of B in these four substrings is 0, 1, 1, and 2. <clears throat> in the implementation, we have four things we needed to name. Two parameters to the function and the iteration variable in each of the uh, nested uh, list comprehensions. So four names we had to think of for these things. Are these good names? I don't know. What if we could just make them go away? So we can. First, we turn uh, all of the function calls into lambdas and replace the comprehensions with applications of map and filter. Then we define a couple of utility functions for replacing the equals syntax for turning multi-argument functions into arguments that take a single uh, into functions that take a single argument and return more functions that take single arguments, and uh, function composition, just like you remember from high school math. Um, and then we do the rest, right? So simple. Um, no worries. And uh, you'll see all of the <laughs> all of those variables have disappeared. Now the only thing with a name is numoc, right? Um, so yeah. Trivial. Uh, please, uh, please ignore the fact that I defined three new things and had to give names to those three things to implement that. Um, but actually, those things can be reused over and over again, whereas you can only use a name once in a single scope. So there is, oh, and it looks like Lisp. Um, so uh, point two, keep things nice and general. So here's a useful function that takes an argument and returns it unchanged. It doesn't do anything um, with that argument and doesn't need to know what type it is. Um, so obviously, this is a very useful function. Um, the programmer who's writing this could agonise over what to call A, or they could just pick something and get on with the much more important business of using it. Um, you can generalise this to more complex functions. Um, the less your functions know about the data they're dealing with, the less you as a programmer have to worry about what to call the thing, and the less someone using the function needs to agonise over what the name of the parameter actually means, because it's abstract. Number three, the name is a lie. So here's a function f takes an x's, right? Um, you're, not, you're not allowed to see the implementation of this function. It's redacted. What does f do? At the moment, we have no idea other than takes one argument. So let's give it some types, some Python-y flavored PEP484 types. OK, now we know something about what this function does. We know that x's has to be a list of a for all a, and we know that it returns a, uh, a list of that same type a. This doesn't tell us everything about what the function does, but it gives us more information than we had before. That tells us everything the function does. What does this function do? Someone yell it out. OK, there isn't time. It's list reversal. Um, so any, fun any function that with that type that satisfies those properties must be the reversing of a list. Now, of course, PEP484 is not expressive enough to lift those properties up into the type system. But there are languages that are that expressive. Maybe you should use them. And then it doesn't matter if the function is called not reverse. It's definitely reverse. And you know that just from the type. You never have to see the implementation. Finally, I want to emphasize names are just labels for concepts. You don't always have to agonize over coming up with One a name minute. that embodies some intuition about what the thing is. It is still useful just to have an agreed term for some concept. Here's an example. Um, imagine uh, an abstraction or a concept. We have a binary operator in some set, um, a way of combining two elements. The result is always defined. 
And furthermore, the operator is associative. What will we call this thing? If you're a Java programmer, you'll call it an iAssociative Closed Combinable. <laughs> now we add the idea of a neutral element that can be combined with any other element, and it doesn't change its value. And that's, of course, an iAssociative Closed Combinable with neutral element extends iAssociative Closed Combinable. That's a bit of a mouthful. So in functional programming communities, we use these terms, which mostly come from mathematics. Um, and they have a concrete meaning. But uh, basically, people think that functional programmers use these terms to you know, condescend yes. to other programmers. And that's what I'm on at is. Next slides, thank you. Thank you, Fraser. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Stop. Um, yeah, apparently every year Fraser gets up on stage and convinces us about functional programming by explaining it from first principles. I assume that eventually he expects it will listen one year and he'll stop presenting and present something new. But until then, we are doomed to listen to that talk until uh, uh, for every year, forever. But thank you again, Fraser. It's great to see you. Um, uh, so up on deck, we have Ned, but first Mike Leonard with High Risk Demo Episode 2, Attack of Something. <laughs> no one's getting attacked, don't worry. Um, last year, my colleague came up here and did High Risk Demos Episode 1. He can't be here, so I thought I'd carry on his legacy. Um, so I'm going to try and do a demo and see what happens. Um, so I'm going to demo quickly um, AWS Chalice. Um, so who here likes programming? Woo! Half the people, that's okay, I guess. Um, <laughs> who here likes deploying code? <laughs> okay, hardly, hardly anyone. Awesome. So we can do all programming and no deployment. Um, with Chalice, which is fantastic. Um, unfortunately, um, earlier there was a presentation um, by Paul Fenwick, who kind of, presentation, uh, cabaret performance, um, <laughs> uh, who kind of stole my thunder with Zapper, but Chalice is very, very similar. So I'm going to quick live demo and try and go from nothing at all, just a virtual env, to a deployed API. So first of all, pip install. Uh, so this is really hard, this is really hard down here. <laughs> pip install Chalice. We're installed. We go chalice, new project. We'll go PyCon. Ah. Got a new project. We can see the into PyCon. We can now take a look at what we've got in there. So we've got a uh, file app.py. We can cat app.py. You can see, basically, it's like a Flask app, kind of exactly like we saw with Zapper earlier. So these are basically the same, from what I can see. Um, and then we can go Chalice, deploy. This goes to AWS, creates Lambda function. Um, it sets up all your access roles in uh, AIM. Um, and it also sets up um, Amazon API gateway thing, I don't know what it is, um, to also talk to those Lambda functions. And you can have a whole API in the cloud as quick as I can finish speaking, probably, maybe, come on. <laughs> Deploying, there we go, I've got a URL. We can take that URL. Ah. Copy it, curl, paste. And then we have hello world return, like we saw in the file. We've got an API deployed and made from just a virtual env in like a minute with an explanation. There you go. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, so up on deck we have uh, Luke Della, but first, we're ready to go over here. The, uh, the problem is the internet was too good for the previous talk, which meant that we didn't, uh, didn't burn all the time. Um, uh, and uh, I actually didn't prepare any jokes today, which is quite unfortunate. Um, so uh, how about we, we race the two presenters and see who gets a working computer first. Uh, microphone's coming. Yeah. Oh, hang on. We've got someone working. Yes. Right, you can stop whistling. Let's go, Ned. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, yes, my name's Ned. Um, 
You can find me at nedned.net. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm going to talk about uh, PyEnv, which is, uh, helps you with Python version and also virtual env management. Uh, okay. So um, there's basically two things that PyEnv helps you with in particular. So one of which is, uh, I'm sure, well, I hope you all are sort of aware, and if not, you definitely don't want to go around sudo pip installing things. As soon as you start doing that, you're competing with your system package manager, and you're going to get conflicts. But you know, when I was first uh, sort of getting started with my Python adventures, I would keep seeing this recommendation or this admonishment, don't sudo pip install things, but I, w I didn't have a convenient way of having local Python uh, installation. So I would. Every, I, would, I would inevitably end up doing sudo pip install, even though I felt a bit bad about it. Um, second of all, we know that we need, uh, we need virtual ends. We need a way to manage our dependencies and isolate them in different um, uh, environments. So who, uh, can I get a hands up? Who has activated a virtual end with either directly on the command line or using some tool that does it at some point? Right, so that's like a whole lot of you, cool. Um, what about now, put your hands up if someone, if for anyone who uses a like in their primary workflow some tool that helps you manage your virtual ends. Cool. So we've still got a few up, um, which is good because I think anyone who knows that you know having to do source activate gets a bit tedious after a while. Uh, so for those of you who put their hands up, who gets their IDE to do it for them? We've got a couple, yep, okay, there's a sort of scattering. What about Conda? Conda's one way, like that's I think that's fairly popular. There's a few more perhaps. Uh, what about virtual end wrapper? Ah, oh, so there's more, okay, yeah, that's pretty popular. Um, has anyone tried pip file? This is a new thing from uh, Kenneth uh, Reed. Uh, um, yes, there's a few. Um, uh, it's, I've heard good things about that. I've been meaning to check it out. Um, but I want to talk to you about PyEnv. Um, and basically, it helps you with those two different uh, needs that I just described before. So first of all, what we can do with PyEnv is um, we can uh, install arbitrary Python installations. So we can do PyEnv install 3.6.2, 2.7.13. Uh, we can even install PyPy. Now, these are all uh, available via PyEnv, so they've actually kind of, you can tab complete and you get a list of, you know, Anaconda and different installations. So now we can run this command PyEnv global that's specifying the Python 3 and Python 2 as our sort of default Python versions. Now, if we run the command Python versions, it tells us, right, we've got our system Python, we've specified 3 and 2, they're the main sort of default global versions. There's also the PyPy one there we just installed. So that's neat, we've got some Python versions. And they're in local user space. We can pip install to our heart's content. But if we're pip installing, we need to do that using a virtual env. Um, and uh, PyEnv gives us this as well. Uh, it's actually via a plugin, but basically it means that we can do PyEnv virtual env on top of version 3. Let's create a virtual env called demo. Now let's, on top of version 2, let's create a virtual env called legacy. Because Python 2 is legacy Python. Um, OK, so now if we do PyEnv versions, we'll get all of these. And we'll see we've added. The uh, virtual ends, they're duplicated, but basically you'll see the two different ones essentially added below them. So now we can treat the virtual ends on top of the local versions as sort of analogous. They can sort of mix and match. Now, how do you actually manage these virtual ends? Well, we've got a hierarchical sort of command, like if we want to switch between them, we can specify it in the local shell if there's a certain environment variable was specified. Uh, otherwise, is it the case that there was a .python version specified in your directory uh, that will then automatically activate the one that you want? Uh, otherwise, it's going to look back towards the, uh, the, the globally specified one. So that's the, sort of the next level up. And finally, if none of them matches, it's just going to use your system Python. So typical workflow is we make a new directory, a new proj. Uh, we're going to give the demo uh, virtual env inside of .python env. And now if we change directory into new prod, you'll see that it's automatically activated the demo virtual env. So we just change into the project minutes. you want, and you've got it. it. And that, I think, is like one of the killer features of this, none of this sort of messing around the command line. Uh, it also gracefully locates appropriate executables. So if you, and it does this via a shim system. So if you look in pyenv shims, it's add that to our path. And then so when you look up commands, python, python2, pip, jupyter, whatever, you're installing a virtual env, that goes into the shim, and then it works out what's the current virtual env activated or version, and then it'll proceed. Uh, lastly, pyenv uh, gives you, with another tool, which I won't talk about, but I recommend checking out pip tool, gives you a nice way to compile your requirements.txt from a more higher level requirements.in, which means you don't have to faff around with the, the, the minute sort of requirements.txt. Those two tools together is a sort of a really happy path, I think, and it really works for my uh, workflow. It might work for yours. Um, so in conclusion, uh, it helps you install, manage local Python versions, and frictionless, frictionless activation of virtual ends.
Oh, thank you, Ned from nedded.net. <laughs> Did I get that right? Yes. Okay, our last lightning talk for the day is from Luke. Hi, guys. My name's Luke. Um, I'm going to try a live demo. Um, so what I particularly Ooh. want to share is um, an experience I had in production. So I don't know about you, but sometimes uh, I can get quite unlucky. And usually, if I get unlucky, it's, it's in production, uh, not never on my development machine. Um, uh, to, be, to begin with, though, I, I'm just going to um, uh, revise what the, um, uh, uh, the Python garbage collector and a couple of methods we have in Python. Um, I'm sure everyone's familiar with init. There's another one called del, which is like the opposite. It's called when uh, an object is, is destroyed. So here's a, here's a simple class I've written uh, with an init and a del. Uh, and I'm going to run this uh, interactively. Um, I'm going to pull up another window. Um, you can see. I'll make it big enough. Um, I'm going to run Python minus i. So I'm interactive. All right, so I've got my class foo that I've defined. Um, so when I, when I construct a foo, I get, um, I, I get the message because the, the, the constructor is called. And then when I, when I delete this object, um, the del is called. Uh, simple, right? Um, where garbage collection comes in, um, garbage collection doesn't come in here. Um, for those familiar with it, I'm sure there are many in this room. Um, garbage collection comes in when there's a reference cycle involved. So um, I'm, I'm going to construct a reference cycle. Um, so here's a list that contains a foo object. Um, now, to make this a cycle, I'm going to actually uh, append another element to this list, which is the list itself. Uh, so notice foo, foo itself um, doesn't have a reference to itself, but it's, it's referenced by a circular data structure. Um, it's, it's not the fault of of my class, it's just whoever's using my class. Um, I'm not going to print out the, the list X because I, that, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> thankfully the, the refer of a list in Python uh, uh, doesn't, doesn't, doesn't be silly. So you can see the dot dot dot. Um, <laughs> now you, uh, so, so now when I'm going to, I'm going to delete X, see my object's still alive. Um, in fact, my object's going to stay alive until the garbage collector kicks in. Um, it hasn't kicked in yet. Uh, it's going to take quite a while to kick in. Uh, there is this module in Python called GC, which actually gives you some access to the internals of the garbage collector. It's a great, a great manual page about it. Um, uh, uh, let me show you this one. Get uh, thresholds. Uh, oop, I spelt it wrong. What's it called? Get threshold singular. Th this one tells you, um, uh, basically, uh, there need to be 700 object allocations or deallocations before the garbage collection um, uh, he's going to run. So, yeah, th these are essentially um, thresholds. Uh, uh, f um, uh, for several generations of garbage collection, that all the details are on this, this GC page. It's really inter interesting to look at. Um, I'm not going to get into it now. Um, what I'm going to do is show you another demonstration. Uh, this is my. Um, I get to open my other window. Uh, show you my code. Okay. Here I've got a, a, a bit more of a, um, a bit more of an involved example. Um, what I've introduced here is a lock. So there's a lock in my constructor and a lock in my destructor. Notice I'm still actually single threaded here. I'm not going to launch any other threads. This is just, just going to be in the same thread. Um, what I've got here is a function that's going to exercise uh, this. Um, uh, so it's going to do um, uh, a lot of um, but basically a lot of uh, what I just showed you in the, in the interactive demo. Uh, you can do it up to a million times. Um, I, I, could, I could set these thresholds down so it occurs, um, so garbage collection kicks in much more frequently. I'm not going to do that. I, I think the, the defaults are going to work here. Um, any ideas what's going to happen to this code? One minute. <laughs> <laughs> just enough time. Let's have a look. Uh, we're on Python. I'm at 2.py. Look, it, it did uh, 341 iterations, and now it's locked up. So control C. I can't even break out of my app. What's <laughs> actually happened? Garbage collection is, uh, the trouble with garbage collection is it kicks in at, at, at any point in, in, in the thread of your code. So when I've allocated enough objects um, and the garbage collection kicks in, I, I can't really predict where it's going to kick in. It's kicked in uh, while, pr probably uh, while uh, in the constructor while this lock is held. Um, now, so I, I can't, there's no, no really, there's actually no safe way to use a lock in a destructor. Um, this is, this is similar to the, um, 
the problem of signal safety in the sea world, if you've ever worked in, in the sea world. This is a, an analogy where um, you can't predict where something's going to happen. Yeah, anyway, that's a nice little, um, nice little issue. Thank you. There's a... Um There's a, somewhat of a moral of the story when you discuss concurrency, you never actually find out what the bug is most of the time. <laughs> and so it is. Uh, that is all the lightning talks we have time for today. Um, if you want to do a lightning talk, we actually have time for more lightning talks at roughly this time tomorrow. There will be cards on the board uh, at about 8.30 tomorrow morning. Uh, please don't put up your own bits of paper. I will probably remove them depending on how I feel at 8.30. So. Uh, <laughs> Try your luck. Um, thanks to all of our presenters. And uh, thanks to all of you for sticking around. The conference kicks off again tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. Thank you very much.